Hello and welcome to the Minds in the Frontline podcast, brought to you by the Frontline Strong Together 5 program. FST5 provides streamlined access to behavioral and mental health services, as well as crisis resources for Michigan's Frontline 5 workers and their families. This includes all professional, part-time, and volunteer firefighters, EMS, law enforcement, corrections officers, and 911 dispatchers in Michigan and their immediate family members. First responders and mental health experts collaboratively created FST5 to provide 24-7 live support, effective resources, and cutting-edge services to prevent and alleviate PTSD, anxiety, depression, and other frontline work-related mental and behavioral health challenges. Need help now? If you are a frontline worker in Michigan or an immediate family member experiencing any crisis, work-related, substance abuse, depression, relationships, finances, or any other, reach out by calling 1-833-34-STRONG or go to fst5.org for more information. I'm Jeff Lassers, one of the hosts of the Minds on the Frontline podcast, and I'm a professional firefighter, paramedic, educator, and content creator. Minds on the Front Line is co-hosted by Mike Mattern, who is also a professional firefighter and paramedic. In addition, Mike is a peer support team member for his fire department and the FST5 program, as well as the chair of the Michigan Professional Firefighters Union Behavioral Health Committee and a board member of the Michigan Crisis Response Association. Mike has training and experience with frontline worker mental and behavioral health. On the other hand, I do not. My role is to produce the show whereas Mike is our resident subject matter expert. Together, we hope to inform, educate, and entertain frontline workers, their families, and the public regarding the realities of frontline, work-related, mental, and behavioral health challenges. In today's episode, you'll get to know us better as we share our personal insights from our journey as first responders and discuss the catalyst for creating this podcast. Please check us out on YouTube, Instagram, and Facebook, and make sure to like and subscribe to all Minds in the Frontline podcast social media channels. Thank you. Enjoy the show. Hi, Mike. What's up, Jeff? How are you? Well, I'm great. I'm alone with you. Well, I don't know about that, but all right, you know. It's technically alone. We got Johnny in the booth. He's yeah. hanging out. He's hanging out with us. This is uh, this is a different setup for us. Yeah. Looking you straight in the eye, not sitting next to me, nudging me and kicking me in the leg is going to be different today. Yeah, it's weird not hiding in the corner. I'm actually out here with, with the regular folk. Well, this is my spot. I know. I'm, I'm actually out in the world now, not hidden in the corner, so it's nice. Yeah. So the point today is, I think, to get to the fact that we really haven't given anybody background on who we are. We do the little flyover at the beginning, professional firefighters, trainers, da, da, da. but nobody really knows who we are. So today we're going to give everybody that insight into our background and introduce them to how we kind of became partners on the Minds in the Frontline podcast, co-hosts under the banner of the Frontline Strong Together 5 program. So I think it's probably better if you start off just kind of given your background. How did you even get started into behavioral and mental health? Because they selected you because you were kind of an expert. So I think starting from there and working your way to that, I think is the best part. Well, I think experts being a little generous. Well, it's relative compared I, to me. It's like in Inglorious Bastards. You know the third most Italian. Yeah. I don't know Italian. Like I said, third most. Yes. <laughs> and, and I think it's just, as we talk here, I think it's just going to be one of those things where it's kind of a learned experience. It's nothing that you really seek out and read books and that kind of stuff. I think as you and I both talk, I think people are going to realize that we've experienced a lot of stuff that brought these two paths that eventually crossed. And we've talked back and forth with the two of us, and but I think it's a good outlet now that we have to now talk about our backgrounds a little bit. We're not going to get in depth with some of that stuff. I think we're going to save that for future episodes, yeah. uh, but we're going to do kind of a flyover. Sure. So I would have to say firefighting, that happened on November 7th, 1984, the day I was born, and that's all I've ever wanted to do. I literally was born wanting to be a firefighter. Eventually found out my uncle was actually a firefighter in Dearborn. You know, I used to go up there. That was like my birthday gift every year was to go to the station, see the trucks, hang out. And the cool part now is those stations that I grew up going to as a kid, I now work at. 
I look at these stations like I've been roaming these halls for 30 some years and it's pretty cool to work for the department that I grew up with, which is awesome. Yeah, you grew up in the town too. I so grew up in the town, so I'm a hometown kid. Yeah, you know, what hometown I mean? kid who so, spent time in that firehouse, who's now serving that community. Yeah, that's, that's very Mike Mattern. It is, it, and there's not a place in the world else I'd rather work. Literally, growing up, that's the only place I really wanted to work. That was my dream. That was my goal. That's something in the water there, because I think Dearborn Fire has more Dearborn kids and local people that join their fire department than most other communities. There is. There's a lot of guys. It's funny. There's a lot of guys that work there that I went to school with, you know, I grew up with. I, you know, we used to go play sports at the school together. So we all grew up together, you know, and I think it's it's kind of cool to do that. A couple guys, you know, the Farrell brothers who I've known forever. That's their name, not their title. Yeah. Yes, exactly. They are feral, but it's yes, it's their yes. Name. Adam and Matt. It, it was kind of cool growing up, knowing what I wanted to do. I ended up getting my EMT license. I did the class when I was seventeen. The summer after I graduated high school, got my basic when I was eighteen. Got my medic when I was nineteen. So I started working on the road as a medic as a nineteen-year-old. Let me tell you. As a 19-year-old, as a medic, that's an eye-opening experience. Yeah. Looking um, back, it's almost too soon. Looking back, yes, it was too soon because, yeah. I mean, I, I did it because I knew what I wanted to do. You also knew that to get a job, you needed to get that medic license. Yes. Get that out of the way. Motivated yes. right out of high school. Then go to the fire academy because back then, you're testing against hundreds of people. You had to be hyper-motivated. 100%, but it also, you're young enough to where you don't necessarily know how to deal with your own shit. Yeah. I would have an infant that I was doing CPR on at 19 years old, dropping a tube, putting an IO in, pushing drugs, that kind of stuff. All my other friends had no relation to that whatsoever. You know, normal and, life and friends, you mean. Normal life friends. Yeah. They're going to frat parties and, and all this other stuff. And at 19, you know, they're like, well, how was your day at work? And you're, you drop that on them. There, there was no, you know what I mean? And you didn't yeah. necessarily know how to deal with it because... The older people that you worked with, you know, the average age person that I worked with was like in their 30s. Sure. So, you know, and they were the, yeah, just move on, kid. It's all right. Ah, well, no. yeah. Well, you took it as a badge of courage because at that age, you, you're walking into a profession that you think, well, this is what we deal with. And we put on a face. And it's very easy at that age, oh, at yeah. 19, as a young man, to just say, yep, let's get after it. And yep. let's just keep stacking those experiences on top 100%. of 100%. Yeah. 100%. The other weird part is like at 19, 20 years old. I remember going in to see a guy, we got back, we saved, and I went in to go talk with him, and he goes, oh, man, you know, I really appreciate what you did, blah, 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 and I uh, goes, uh, you know, I'd, I'd like to buy a beer sometime, and I looked at him, and I go, yeah, you, you can't. He's like, well, no, I really want to. I go, no, really, you can't. I'm only 20. I can give narcotics. I could give yeah. morphine if I need to, but I can't walk in the store and buy a beer. You know what I mean? So right. it's one of those weird things, but uh, got hired in the department just after I turned 21. And, you know, 19, 20, 21, you think you know everything about everything. You go into this adult world of the fire department where you're working with 40 and 50 year olds who ha actually have some life experience. It's a little bit of a culture shock to you. You know what I mean? Especially coming in wet behind the ears, you think you know everything and you grow up pretty fast. You have to. There's not really room for immaturity and they'll make sure they get it out of you. But start working there, you know, obviously, same thing. It was the same culture where, you know, go deal with some shitty calls and you don't really say anything to anybody about it and you just move on and it's that old school culture. How did you go from firefighter paramedic to, hey, I'm into this stuff, knowing that you came in with a generation who didn't care? I would have to say, that, you know, I had a lot of life issues that went on during that time. But the biggest one was finally having a run that affected me. To the point where I knew it affected me, but I didn't know what to do with it. So I kind of carried on the the line of keep your mouth shut and move on. And that caused a lot of issues at home. It caused a lot of issues with myself personally. It came to a head eventually at one point, And, you know, we could talk about that later. But it was that crossroads moment. I can either go this way or I can go this way. And, you know, luckily I went a certain way. Ended up finding a therapist that I really liked. And that who really got me through what I was dealing with that had piled on for years before that, you know, all those runs that I kind of stuffed away in my backpack, the one that finally broke the camel's back led me to where I was. And, and so helped me unpack all that stuff while doing it. I, I remember sitting in her office and she goes, 
with your experiences, have you ever thought about where you guys talk to other firefighters about this stuff? And I started laughing at her. And I said, that, that'll that never work. And she goes, well, why not? And I go, because we don't talk about this shit. And so it was kind of funny. And, and I always kept it in the back of my head like it was something that I wanted to do because it, I always thought it was pretty screwed up that we don't have anything. We see all this stuff. Everybody knows it's the elephant in the room, those types of things. But it was never anything that we would ever talk about. And when you say you didn't have anything, you meant locally. You just recognized it like, I don't know what everybody else has, but I'm telling you right now, as far as I know, this doesn't exist. There was nothing. They would hand you an EAP card, right. and that was it. In my experience, they sent in somebody to talk to us after the bad run, and this dude, his wingtip shoes told me that he had never been in a firehouse before. This is a true story, bro. He pulls up the chair, flips it around backwards like he's the cool guy. Yeah. Right? And this guy's probably only a year or two older than me. And this was after a child run where a child died. He's talking to me, and I kind of got into the story of what I found. And he looks at me. He goes, yeah, man, I totally understand. And I just looked at him, and I go, thanks for your time. And I stood up and walked out. You know, that's what was offered to us. Yeah. You know, that was my mental health experience. That was my critical How incident How long ago was this? What, what year do you think that was? That was 2017. Okay, so it's incredible that now that person would get laughed out of the room pretty much anywhere in our areas. Yeah, 100%. Because cultural competency is a thing, and that's one yeah. of the biggest things we've really learned, in my opinion, in the last couple of years, is that huge value of a culturally competent clinician that knows what not to do when they walk into a firehouse, a dispatch center, an EMS agency, a cop shop, whatever it is. Y'all got to understand us. And I think that's a, a big one. Was that a turning point that said, hey, what's up with this? And you wanted to get involved and improve it? Or did you just want to walk away from it? At the point where I talked to that guy? Yeah. I was done with it. I thought it was a joke. At that point, that was the only thing. Other Very thing, common that was, reaction. That, that was yeah. a common reaction, but that was the only thing that was offered to us. Right. So when I walked out that door, I was like on my own. It, there was it, nothing. There was no one else who I was going to call. Right. Nobody knew of any. You got two choices, right? You, you go EAP or you don't talk. Go anybody. drink. Go. That's it. Right. You're going to go drink, yes. go do drugs, go yes. whatever the thing is. Right. And that's what sometimes people make that choice. And I think that's one of the big highlights here is that thankfully you recognize to make the right choice. You got lucky that you had, wow. I'm not saying everything you do was right, but you, you sought help and you eventually got that help and it may be not be as, as direct, but I think maybe you identified the fact that, holy crap, how can I make this path smoother for other people? The road was rough to the point where I finally found a clinician to talk to. Okay. There was a very rough road there. So it wasn't like you walked out the door and was like, was I can no, either no, do no. bad or I can do good. It was like, I, I need help. I didn't and talk to a clinician for probably six or eight months after that run. And in those six to eight months, there was a huge deterioration in my side of things. I went down the rough road, probably what every other person here that we talked to experienced until I finally made that decision to go talk to somebody. What made you make that decision? you just sick of making all the wrong decisions? Got to a point where I almost lost everything because of it. And so it was like, I need to get my shit together. You know, I've got a son at home. I've got to get my shit together and get this thing right. What do you think the impact was of being a young firefighter paramedic who went 10 years before he really had any personal life things he had to deal with, Right. You went about 10 years yeah. of going on calls, but really weren't impacted. So you have stacks of calls you've been on and then real life problems at home. You had a lot to deal with there. So like, it's almost like it wasn't just the run. It was The run was it almost was the a symbol yes. of everything leading up to that. It, it was the pressure cooker that I had been living in between Drew's issues, my dad having cancer, and then these runs. Yeah. It, it was that pressure cooker that everything came together. And so, like I said, I went, went to talk to somebody. And since she had mentioned that, it always was in the back of my head. And I'm a person who, I'm religious, but I don't, I'm not a holy roller, if that makes sense. And so yeah. I, I always said, you know, if this is something I'm supposed to do, there'll be a sign. And for the longest time, there was nothing, you know, I'll know when it's the right time. Because like I tell everybody who wants to get into peer support after they had some shit go down, I had to have myself right before I could do any of this stuff. But I always thought, this is screwed up that we don't have anything. This is screwed up that there's a million other people who are dealing with this shit, the same shit that I dealt with, with no resources whatsoever. 
And this system has to change because I know what I dealt with and I know what I went through and I thought it was bullshit that anyone else would have to go through it. The timing would be right. I'd get that sign that the timing was right. I don't remember how long it was after that, but I remember sitting at our union meeting and our union guys had just come back from the IFF convention and they had mentioned that this new thing called peer support was a thing now that, that they wanted to start. And I remember them mentioning, they go, well, if anyone's interested in starting a peer support team, come talk to us. And I remember sitting there, I got this big smile on my face and I go, here's your sign. And so I volunteered to do it. I, to this day, I thought we were going to be laughed out of the place. You know what I mean? I, I, I never thought it would be what it was. There was 12 of us that started the team. We got it up and running. And within our first year, I mean, we had over 200 contacts. So, you know, the peer support team started rolling, gaining a ton of traction. None of us expected that. And so we started doing the peer support stuff a lot, started doing a lot more call outs, started people, getting people to clinicians. So then after that, uh, I actually saw an article on Wayne State University's program, the Frontline Strong program, that they were starting it. And I thought, well, for shits and giggles, I'd, I'd love to be a part of it. Get, let me make a phone call. That one phone call changed everything. You know, I got a hold of Manisha. We started talking, started working with Wayne State. I wouldn't even call working. They, I was just showing up and giving them my thoughts on things, you know. And then the Behavioral Health Committee for the MPFFU showed up. And I go, well, you know what? Maybe I can help change stuff on a state level. Somehow I became the chairperson of the Behavioral Health Committee. And that's kind of where our stories kind of intertwine is I remember we were doing a podcast for to introduce all the committees and you were the one who was doing the podcast. Well, you got to call this Jeff Lasser's guy. He's a podcast guy, but <laughs> you know, okay, sounds good. I never done one in my life. You know, I showed up up in Lansing, had no idea what I was doing. And that's where you and I kind of met. Yeah. And that's where I think down the road, we, you know, we started talking a little bit. And I was shocked when you said you were kind of interested in the mental behavioral health portion of everything. From there, it just kind of took off. We, you know, I, we talked yeah. to Manisha, and now we're here doing that kind of thing. You know, so that's kind of like my my arch on how our paths crossed. I mean, what's yours? It's interesting you bring it up like that. Like you said, the, he's a podcast guy, and for years before that, I was like an EMS guy, right? And I was a training guy. It's funny, like every seven years, I have a new thing I'm known as, which is kind of cool that I'm not always the same thing. I guess that means I'm evolving, hopefully. But I would say I got into the mental health thing because I was interested in my own mental and behavioral health. I've always known I've had my own issues. Even since I was a kid, I've always suffered from a level of anxiety and depression that seems to be genetically related and, you know, sometimes environmentally impacted. So I've had to like really analyze myself for years and then figure out what it is and then just kind of like give in to things like therapy and other things. But my background, like you, a little kid, I'm like, I'm gonna be a fireman paramedic. A little bit different. I didn't know right away. My dad grew up a very brittle diabetic. He was a type one diabetic. Unfortunately, he was the most compliant diabetic that ever existed. Nobody ate better than him, took care of himself better. He could swim a mile every single day. That's hard if you ever try to swim a mile. And when we couldn't get him out of a hypoglycemic situation, you got to call fire. Yeah, right? yeah, He's at call. the point where I can't get him to do anything now. And I always noticed that the firefighters always were having a good time. They had a team and they got to help people. And that left a massive impression on me. So I, at that point, I knew it was just subconsciously there. And, you know, fast forward, I'm 22 years old. I'm starting a job with the West Bloomfield Fire Department. I got the greatest job in the world. And let's go. And just like you, my brain's not fortified. You're going on all these calls. You're doing all this stuff. And even though I knew, and at this point in my life, I had already experienced therapy. I wouldn't say that at that point I was like a huge therapy advocate, but I certainly understood it had its place in the medical procedure world for people that needed it. But how open were you to talking about Nobody. it? Exactly. Nobody. Nobody knew. Exactly. But yep. I had a damn idea. Exactly. I wouldn't even tell girlfriends. Yep. Like, no, 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 no. Yep. I did my own thing. You, you can back up. Yep. Yeah, and I always had my own internal struggles. I had nothing to do with the fire department. So I was already like walking into this with a preconceived or, you know, a preset notion of I might be impacted. 
And not knowing the impact of those calls, being young and being able to say, it's not my problem, and not knowing that you're kind of storing those away, it builds up. And you see stuff, and then eventually it eats you away. And then you have kids, and you're like, oh, my God. Like, everything becomes more sensitive. It, right after I got hired, uh, I'm a busybody, so I got into training and education. There was more availability to train an EMS because it wasn't as popular to train an EMS, so I just took the open water and went with it. And I was also a fire instructor, too, so I've done a lot of both boatload of education development and then this thing happened called the COVID-19 pandemic. Oh god. Yeah, don't even start on that. Right, right, right. And so my side gig at the time uh was I was working for the Oldham County Medical Control Authority. We wrote protocols education. So like what do you do when you got 3500 EMS people that you got to tell about COVID? I'm like, well, I'm going to Google how to do a podcast. <laughs> Yeah. 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 <laughs> so I, I'm YouTubing how to make, you know, this all work. And I figured it out. And next thing you know, we're getting to all the people, all the information. So pandemic ends within a year or whatever. And we transitioned that podcast into all things EMS. It's called the EMS on air podcast. And then I got, I met uh, representatives from the Michigan professional firefighters union. And I, I wanted to get more involved. It was at a point in my life. I had kids, I was married and I wanted to do that whole, let's get more involved in my future. So the union, and I approached and we started a podcast with them. And in our very first 10 episodes, it was to introduce all of the, the representatives and you being a representative of mental and behavioral health. Uh, we sat down, we vibed, we had a really good chat. Oh, and yeah. I was like, well, can't we like talk about what you're doing with FST5? It seemed so obvious to me. And it was just all these things lined up. You came prepared. You had a knowledge base. You helped to fortify this system. And then I had a background in communications and education and kind of like logistics. And it's like, this couldn't work any better. And now here we are helping people. We're here, like this. Here we are. The edutainment arm of the Frontline Strong Together 5 program. Yeah. And let, let me ask you this. You started off with very minimal knowledge. Yeah, very little. Okay. We've been doing this a year. Mm-hmm. What does Jeff now understand better now after doing this a year, mental health wise? What, like, what is the biggest impact it's had on you? So I will say that I think the problem is massive, but the benefit is it's a simple problem to understand and it's universal. So it's not like we need to figure out an answer for every different area other than access to, to support services. I will say that every single human needs to understand this. We all need to have a little bit of patience with each other because you don't know what's going through somebody else's head at the time. And I think that's the number one thing is that I've recognized the internal struggles that people are dealing with on a daily basis. And just because they may look like they're not having an issue and we got to get something done or whatever that thing is, it could just be somebody in line who's bothering you at Target <laughs> you just got to recognize that, hey, we're all in this together, and that person might be going through some, give them a little bit of slack. Oh, 100%, I think. That's my number one. Yeah, no, I think that's a good thing, because I, I know it's been fun to watch you pick up on this stuff and learn it. You're into it now. Yeah. You know what I mean? Like, I can tell you're into it, and that's the cool part about it, you know? It's one of those things that I enjoy doing this, because it's, you know, we've talked about it before. We get some of this feedback on the social media stuff. I mean, what are some of the things that you've seen that we've had that people have left comments on? Oh yeah. Other than the comments, I've gotten text messages like, Hey, I just want you to know through your last episode, I gave to somebody and they reached out and got help. Dude, awesome. Dude, well, that, I don't, they didn't elaborate and they don't need to. No. <laughs> so that was great. And then there's other comments like, Hey, literally the same thing. I think just last week, somebody put, Hey, just so you know, this episode helped me convince somebody to go get help who was suicidal. That's massive. That's massive. They're just I mean, talking about it. What was the one thing you and I always said when we started this podcast? Just takes one. Just want to help one person. If, if this podcast helped one person. Well, I, would, I meant me. I hope it helps me. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> this one person. No. <laughs> Let's talk about that, Jeff. <laughs> of course, Michelle. <laughs> Shout out. <laughs> Shout out to Michelle Potter. Yeah. Uh, but no, I mean, it's, it's been enjoyable and I'm glad our paths have crossed. Absolutely. Um, I know talking, I, I don't have obviously the data right in front of me, but I know for a fact that the frontline strong line has been utilized a lot more since this has started. We've both gone through life experiences. We both have necessarily maybe not done it the right way. Right. That's why we're sitting here talking to you. And I hope that's coming through when we do these things. We're no different than you guys. The only difference is we got a microphone in front of us and we're talking about it. Right. And we hope that it encourages everybody to go seek 
the treatment, seek the help. It's okay to say it's not okay. All those things that we've talked about, I hope the education that we're giving, you know, bringing in Dr. A, Dr. Arash, Dr. King, Manisha, I really hope that you're learning from these experts, not just you and me, why things are happening. Why do you feel that way? Why? Because I think that breaks down a lot of that scariness of how we're feeling too. My vision is that we can evolve this into something that we can continue to convey people's experiences so that we can destroy the stigmas that are still lingering. Yes. That decrease the time it takes for somebody to say, ooh, something going on to, oh, let me pick up the phone and make a call. Yeah. Because if I'm sick, I'm going to call the doctor. It's, it's so automatic now. Yeah. And it, even like the old generation, I'm not going to the doctor. I'm fine. Well, that's all dirt gone. On. Let's do that for our hearts and minds. And that's, that's what I hope this becomes. And I, like we said before, it's like, we got to tell stories. We got to educate. We got to have the really smart people. We got to have the data. We got to have the emotion. What we're saying is we got to talk about it. That's it, man. Over and over and over and over again. I hope what we've achieved so far in all of our conversations is that conversation starter to remind everybody. It's like, we're not going to stop talking about it. To the point where it's normalized and we can use this as a tool to help other people normalize it, whether well, it's in Michigan or otherwise. Absolutely. And, and this is driven by the first responders. So if there's something that you haven't heard us talk about, let us know and bring it up as a topic on the show. Yeah. You know what I mean? We want to hear from the first responders out there. What is some of the stuff that maybe we haven't talked about that that's important to you that you want to hear about? We're more than happy to do it. You know what I mean? So, yeah, that's a good point. We have one episode coming up about EMDR. Yes. Which is this really cool thing that it we did works with Brian amazing. Black. Yeah, and it, it came from somebody contacting us and saying, what are all the different therapies I hear about in podcasts? And can you break those down for me? It's like, yeah. So we're going to start with EMDR. We're going to talk about brain spotting. We're going to talk about uh, the augmented reality. We're going to get into all that. Yes. There's some crazy stuff out there that doesn't include pharmacology that is incredibly impactful that we're going to bring to light for people and destigmatize. And I think sometimes like there's a bunch of people that don't have a stigma. It's like, what's available? Like we can feed those people too that are really thirsty for this. Yes. It, the days of you have to take a drug to yeah. get all this stuff taken care of. They try a lot of other modalities before we get to pharmacology. And they work. And they work. You know, EMDR. Hey, I've done it. It's amazing. Mm -hmm. So, I mean, just know as we move forward, if there's something out there that you guys want to hear, you guys want to talk about, get a hold of us. We're more than happy to talk about it. This is for us, by us type deal. And the last thing I'm going to say is just please reach out. Frontline Strong, amazing program. I can't say enough about it. So if you're struggling, if you know somebody who's struggling, please reach out. That's my biggest thing. I think that's it. All right, my man. Great words, bro. Thank you for joining us in the Minds in the Frontline podcast. We hope everyone enjoyed this episode. We have more great content coming out soon. Please check us out on YouTube, Instagram, and Facebook, and make sure to like and subscribe to all Minds in the Frontline podcast social media channels. Thank you for listening, and have a great day.